Good morning. Welcome to this week's program of Study the Word. This program is sponsored every week by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. We're glad you've joined us again this morning. We're going to be dealing with a Bible question in just a few moments. I'd like to make mention of the fact that if you have your question on your mind, we'll deal with it on this program. Just leave it on voicemail. There's the number. Or text it to us. We'll be glad to deal with it. And, of course, the website is there for you to check out our programs that we've uploaded uh, onto our website, all our past programs for almost the past five years. Okay, so I'll put that num number up for a longer period of time at the end of the program so you can take advantage of our free Bible study helps. But we need to get into our study today. We've got a lot of material to cover. All right, so what we're going to talk about today, our question comes from... We talked about the book of Revelation last week. Well, we're in Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to deal with the question of, well, what does it mean that Jesus said that your lampstand would remove, be removed from its place? What, what does it mean? Well, it's a great question. Um, we're going to back up and read the context to this. If you're not familiar with Revelation chapter 2 and 3, seven letters were written to seven different churches in Asia. Five of them were told that they needed to repent of something. Two of them were encouraged to continue on being faithful. And so we're noticing this question is from the first one that was written to the church at Ephesus. Now this is the same congregation you can read about in the book of Ephesus. Um, that we have in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, rather, the book of Ephesians. Okay, let me begin reading so you can see what leads up to this, because that's going to help us explain what uh, Jesus is talking about here. So, Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, talking about Jesus and the authority that he has. Jesus comes out and says, I know your works, in verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And, have, and you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. That's really important to notice here. The Lord is praising these brethren for their godly behavior. Everything is good. The lesson to be learned here, as far as if you're going to rebuke somebody, you don't want to let on that they don't do anything that's good. Okay, If you're trying to help them, there's a lot to learn from Jesus, the master teacher. Because in verse 4, now here, here's where he lowers the boom. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Verse 5, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I, re re I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I'll just go ahead and read verse 6 where he says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I, saw, I also hate. So he comes back with another positive. Okay, so what are we learning here? It's where our question comes from. What, what, what does it mean here that when Jesus told them that uh, in verse 5, if you don't repent, he says, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Okay, so to understand this, folks, is to realize that He's writing to the church at Ephesus, okay? He mentions that in, in the very first verse of chapter 2. What is the church? Okay, that's important to understand. The church are Christ's special people, those who have been called out of darkness. You see, in Acts chapter 2, when people became Christians... It says in verse 47 of Acts 2, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Well, what church was that? Well, we know what church that was. It was the church that Jesus said he was going to come and build. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, and Jesus said, 
I will build my church. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm coming. And I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, it said he purchased the church with his own blood. Those who have been covered by the blood of Christ, those who obey the gospel, Jesus automatically adds them to his church. These brethren here at Ephesus, these are individuals who became Christians. This was not a letter written to the city of Ephesus, just to, to all the Ephesians, to all the people who lived in Ephesus. No, no. This was written to that, that small group of Christians that were coming together as a church, the church at Ephesus. And what made them distinct is that they belonged to Christ. It was, there was a church that was at Ephesus, but it was Christ's church. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And we know that Jesus is the head of the church, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. He's the head of it. Um, the church is his body. He has all the authority, Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus has all the authority. Even when Paul traveled around, the apostle Paul, and, and wrote a letter to the brethren at Rome, when he visited other churches... He, he sent greetings, and he said in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. They, they say hello is what he said. So the church of Christ. These seven churches of Asia, they were churches of Christ, those which belonged to Christ. However, with our question today, Jesus says, if you, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove its lampstand from its place. In other words, you're not going to be considered a faithful church of mine. When, when religious groups do any one thing, and it's never just one thing, it's more, but when they do that, then the church loses its distinction and it no longer becomes Christ's church, it just becomes another religious sect. And so... We know from Ephesians chapter 5 the reason why the Lord wrote to the brethren at Ephesus here. They had le left their first love. You might say, well, Lord, why don't you talk about all, why don't you address all those sinful people in the world that are, that are terrible. They do bad things to children. They do bad things to other people. Uh, they steal. They, they curse. And they just do a lot of evils. Why are you writing to the church here. I mean, just because they lost their first love, look at all the good things that you mentioned we did. Remember remember what I talked about there? He commended them. He said, uh, you tested those who said that they were, that they, uh, that they're evil. You found out that they were evil. You tested those who said they were apostles and they weren't. You found them to be liars. He said, you, you persevered and had patience and labored for my name's sake and you haven't grown weary. So they haven't stopped worshiping, st but they lost their first love. Is that really a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. Because Jesus said, if you don't repent, candlestick will be removed. Your standing with me will be removed. You being a light will be removed. You'll just be another religious sect if you do not repent. You see, I read over in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, what the Lord is expecting he says in verse 25 of Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Our Lord is not going to tolerate a local church. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. I mean, if he, uh, Revelations chapter 2 and 3 clearly illustrates that there are churches. There was the church at Sardis. There was the church at, of the Laodiceans. The church at Pergamos. And so on. We're looking at the church at, Eph at Ephesus. 
and the church at Ephesus had become spotted. It had a wrinkle. It was to keep itself pure, unblemished from the world. You'd lost your first love. And he told them they needed to repent. And so, really, what we're talking about today, and with the, what the time we have remaining, I'll try to share as many as I can, because what happened with this church can happen to us today when we lose our distinction. The church that is Christ is distinct, very distinct. And that's the point that Jesus made. You can read those other letters and to those five churches that were, were rebuked, and you can notice some other things that those congregations that were doing that were wrong too. And they needed to repent. And so what I'm wanting us to learn today is, well, what are some signs that, that a church that might say they want to be Christ's church have lost their distinction? Well, the obvious one is, is when the church decides what it wants to be. You see, the Kirkwood Church where I attend, we don't decide how we're going to do things. The Lord has already decided because he's the head of the church and he has all the authority. So he tells us when we are to gather, maybe not the specific time, there is general authority. When the Lord tells us to sing, he didn't tell us how many songs. When he asks us to, to assemble to worship, he didn't tell us what time during the day so that we understand that liberty. But we need to remember that as our Lord, he is the one that makes the rules. We are to abide in the doctrine of Christ, right? Second John 9. But when churches start deciding what their standard of morality is, what they're going to accept, what they're going to te uh, teach, they have their own creeds and their distinct doctrines, when people say, Chuck, well, what are your doctrines? I just hand them the New Testament. No, no, what, what, are, what, are, what are your doctrines? It's, it's the doctrine of Christ. We're just not going to write certain things down and say, here's what we do over here. That's the way we do it with our church. We're going to find out what the Bible says about it. Because if we don't listen to what the Lord says, then the church loses its distinction. And... So, I mean, a congregation might say, you know, our congregation over here practices infant baptism. Chuck, does, does your church practice infant baptism? Oh, I don't have a church. Christ has a church. And he added me to it. And what did he say about infant baptism? Nothing. There's no infant baptism in the Bible. And so you can, uh, a religious group can choose to do that but they're not the church that you read about in the Bible. They have lost the distinction that of, of Christ, and we're trying to help people. So what's another way that the church loses its distinction? Well, first of all, when they, they, they all come under this category of when a church decides what it wants to be. So, for example, when it calls itself by some man-made term. That's, that's when a church has lost its distinction and they have decided what they're going to call themselves. Let's call ourselves, oh, the, the rock. Let's call ourselves the, the community church. Let's call ourselves uh, the brethren church. Let's call ourselves the community, whatever. I may have just said that, but you can open up um, Google all these different names that are out there. You know, somebody will say, well, Chuck, they'll say to me, Chuck, what church do you go to? Well, if I'm going to follow the word of God... There's only one, Christ. Jesus said, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. He didn't say I'm going to build my churches. You say, well, Chuck, weren't there churches, the seven churches of Asia? Isn't that more than one? Well, yes. There's one universal body of Christ with local congregations. But see, these local congregations don't have a head church. Christ is the head. See, the church is the body of Christ. A body can have a head, but the body cannot be the head. But that's what happens. These religious groups, they want to make the rules. They want to, they want to be the head. Well, that, that can't be. And so they'll come up with man-made terms. So what are we going to call Christ church? People say, well, what church do you go to? You know, when people get together and they read the scriptures and they say, well, 
What should we call the church? Christ. It belongs to him, folks. But churches are going to lose its distinction. Oh, they want to be distinct from the church you read about in the Bible. Sure, they can do that. They can come up with any kind of name they want. And they think it's okay because they're making the rules. Another way a church loses its distinction when it establishes its own kind of organization. As we've been talking about here, when, when we think about how the church is to be organized, it was Paul who mentioned by leaving Titus in a place so that he could what? Well, it says right here in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. You need to appoint elders. Elders, another term for elders, pastor, overseer, shepherd, presbyter. And they had to meet these qualifications. In order to be an elder, and there was always two or more in these local congregations, they had to meet the qualification of being blameless, a husband of one wife, can't be a woman, having faithful children, so they had to be old enough that they had children that are old enough to be Christians, not accused of dissipation and insubordination, for a bishop must be, well, wait a minute, bishop. Yeah, bishop is another term for elder. He's a shepherd. He's an overseer. And this is just an example, folks, of how the local church is to be organized. There's not a board of directors that are there. We don't vote on doctrine. I studied with a couple one time, and we were talking about some immoral thing that's going on in the world. And I said, where, where does your, your congregation stand on that? And he said, well, we're going to vote on that soon. There's, there's no voting on morality. We just do what the head says and abide by it. And so we need to be organized the way the Lord designated and abide in those teachings. It's as simple as that. And so you can have elders and deacons and evangelists. He talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I'm a preacher, okay? But, but how we are organized in the work that we are needing to do is to know that we're all one in Christ. Remember in Ephesians? No. I mean, well, it's in Ephesians, but it's also found in Galatians, the, uh, the third chapter. And I want to go over there quickly because it's, it sets forth this principle that's needed when he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ. Equality. So, I'm, I'm, I'm the preacher at the Kirkwood Church of Christ. I'm one of the... One of two, there's another one there, Andrew. What do we call ourselves? Chuck and Andrew. Well, don't you have a title? Well, no. Jesus condemned titles in Matthew chapter 23. And what titles do is they elevate. Religious groups, they don't care. A lot of religious groups, they just don't care. They've lost the distinction of the church you read about in the Bible here. Because they'll call themselves by reverend so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, father so-and-so. What's the Bible teach? Equality. I have a duty to perform, but I'm not above anybody else, folks. We need to learn about the church you read about in the Bible. That's the key. And so when a person asks about this removing of the lampstand of Revelation chapter 2, what does that mean? It just means that they're not listening to the head anymore. They're not being distinct. They're not repenting and coming back to what the Lord teaches. Another thing, how, it, how you lose the distinction is ignoring the work God gave it to do. We have a responsibility as a local church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing, folks, with this weekly program. It's sponsored by who? Well, it's brought to you by the Kirkwood Church of Christ. Who is funding it? The church. Okay, we're, we're not soliciting funds for the community to support this. You know, when you come and visit with us and we take up a collection, one of the first things we say is, if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We're not soliciting your funds. We as members of the Kirkwood Church of Christ are going to take up a collection that we're supposed to do. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The command to take up a collection on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. 
and we do the work that God gave us to do. We're just not building up a big bank account. Our responsibility is to spread the gospel. And one of the tools that we have is this TV program, which we're thankful for. We finance that. It's the churches. This is not my program. It's the, the Kirkwood Church of Christ. It's the members. We're putting forth this effort, folks. And we, we're contributing that way. So that's the work the Lord has given it to do, to evangelize and to edify, to build up the members that we have there, um, to strengthen them. That's the work of the church that we can read about over and over in the scriptures. And we specifically read about that in Ephesians chapter 4. Because when you get down to about, for the sake of time today, we are running out of time, but when you get down to about verse 12, it said these things are given so the church can be edified, to be built up. So we provide teaching. We provide class classes for people to learn. Um, and so we have a place that we can come together to worship. And of course, you have found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, another work of the local church is to provide for their own needy members. Okay. Now, individually, Christians can help anybody that they want, but the local congregation is to take care of the needy saints there. Well, we may have enough time for another one, and that is another way a church can lose its distinction is refusing to be specific in its teaching. You know, when, when you don't handle the Word of God the way the Lord wants, remember what the Lord commended the brethren at Ephesus for? He came right out and told them, he said, you tested those who said they were apostles and they are not, and you found them to be liars. I wonder how they did that. Well, they had to get very specific in their teaching. And that's what we need to do today. When we talk about things that are right and things that are wrong, if you keep things generic, everybody's going to feel comfortable. When you get specific, then people become uncomfortable. And Paul knew this when he was telling the young preacher, uh, Timothy, when he told him how to preach. Because if you don't preach this way, Timothy, you're going to be in trouble with the Lord. Oh, you might not be in trouble with mankind. This passage explains what I'm talking about. Listen to this. He tells young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says in verse 2, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine why won't they endure it because they don't like what they're hearing there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables you're going to find religious groups that are going to swell. They're going to grow. They're going to be huge. They're going to be mega when you preach on things generally all the time. But when you get very specific about the things we've talked about today, then people get uncomfortable. Don't talk about divorce and remarriage. Don't talk about modesty. Don't talk about what the Bible teaches about drinking. Don't, don't teach about... Uh, homosexuality let's not teach about abortion let's not teach about let's not talk about any of those things because if we do talk about those things people are going to get uncomfortable the point is folks we have a responsibility to preach all of God's word and so our time is gone in answering that question today we don't want our lampstand to be removed at Kirkwood we don't want to find ourselves doing things that are unscriptural, things that are not approved by the Lord, because the moment we do that, and if we don't repent and get back on track, then we're just another religious sect. And we want to be a church that does indeed belong to Christ, where he is the head and he's ruling and reigning. And by the way, this free Bible study course that we offer talks about this. I think it's in lesson number four. It's just a six-lesson course. This is lesson number one, and if you would like to enroll in this free home Bible study course, just call it, leave your name and your address, or text it, and we'll get that first lesson in the mail tomorrow morning, and um, his return envelopes. When you're done, we'll check it, return it to you, and send you your next lesson. You work at it at your own speed is the point. 
in the comfort of your own home. What a great way to study. Again, there's no charge for this. It shouldn't cost you to learn the Word of God. And then we have two pamphlets here that we can just throw in if you want them. I'm not going to force anything on you folks. Um, and when you do enroll in this course, you're not going to be inundated with stuff that you didn't request. We just want to help you learn. And if that's your desire. What are these two pamphlets? 40 things that people say are in the Bible that are not. 30 things that are in the Bible that people are saying um, they're not in the Bible, but they really are. Now, what I, what I mean by this when I say people, these are things that are taught in pulpits across the land. They're saying it's in the Bible when it's not and when it, they say it's not and when it really is. And so if you'd like those pamphlets, we'll throw in those and that there's no charge. Would you like to be put on the mailing list for our weekly bulletin? Um, two articles, short articles, talking about the Bible, great lessons to learn. And it would come to you every two weeks with two bulletins in there. And so if you would like to be put on the mailing list, you can also request that when you call or text us. You can say, I'll have, go ahead and send the first lesson with the 4030 tracks and go ahead and put my name on the mailing list for the bulletin. Now, would you like a face-to-face -face Bible study? We can talk about any subject on your mind or we have material that we can go through and study with you. But there's nothing like sitting around the kitchen table and open up our Bibles and studying together. You can invite friends or family members. Um, if you're a lady by yourself, we can bring somebody with us so you won't feel uncomfortable. We can meet at your place. We can meet at the church building, folks, or at another neutral place, wherever you're comfortable and whatever fits into your schedule during the week or on the weekends, morning, afternoon, or night. We're here to help. And so we hope you'll think about those things that we're offering. Now, if you're ever in the Kirkwood area, we have been so encouraged lately having those who watch the TV program have come out to visit, to say hi, to check us out. That, that is wonderful. Come, you'd be our honored guest. We meet Sunday mornings, 9.30 for Bible study. If you can't make it for the Bible study, our worship service starts at 20 after 10. So by all means, come and, and be with us. And it lasts for about an hour. Now we meet Sunday afternoons from 5 to 6. If that fits into your schedule, come and be with us. Uh, you'll hear, we'll have singing and prayers and, and a Bible study, um, usually a sermon. And during the week, midweek, Wednesdays, 7 o'clock, we have a Bible study. We have one for the adult class in the auditorium, but we also have classes for all age groups. So by all means, bring the whole family. We're glad you've taken time out of your busy day to, to study the Word with us. We hope you'll tell your friends and your neighbors about this program and uh, because each and every week we deal with Bible questions that's all we're going to do on this program and we'll give you a straight answer from the Word of God and uh, by all means if you've got a question let us know tune in next week folks you know we're going to open up our Bibles together and we are going to study the Word thank you and have yourselves a great day